Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to play nice with others. Uh, this is mainly talking about tools and to ma mainly tools that you can use in uh, multi-language environments. So first off, my name is Jeremy Heingardner. I'm on Twitter at copiousfreetime and Jeremy at heingardner.org or copiousfreetime.org. So you know, play with that as you like. Um, I work for a company called Collective Intellect. Um, that's that part's not really too important, but the fun part is is all the different things that we use as far as technologies in the production of uh, the products we make. Um, last year, how many were here last year? Did anybody go to mine and Fernand's talk about building a Ruby infrastructure? A few, okay. So still working for Collective Intellect, but our Ruby infrastructure has grown a little bit more and we've added even more uh, systems to our, our entire infrastructure, including we've got some Java services, a couple of C, C++ libraries, uh, a Groovy application, and you know, 20 micro Rails apps, some Sinatra apps, and a whole slew of gems. So in this entire environment, we need to have things that can play nice with each other. We need to be able to have the Java applications use some of the same resources that the Ruby applications do, some of the CC++, you know, the Groovy applications. All these guys need to be able to talk to each other. And what can we use um, besides what everyone loves to use as the relational database? Sometimes that's not the right tool for the job. So we'll start out with. Uh, Everybody raise your hand if you have a, a favorite programming language. <laughs> there shouldn't be a hand down. No, no, ever, keep them up, keep them up. If, raise your hand if you have a, a favorite programming language. Okay, drop your hand, I'll keep it up, we're gonna do a little survey. See how long you can keep your hands up first. No, uh, all right, drop your hand if it's Ruby. We still have some up, good, awesome. Okay, uh, small talk. No, Java, C Sharp. C++, C, assembler. Uh, what am I missing? Lisp. Fourth. Fourth. Okay. <laughs> PHP. JavaScript. JavaScript. And Perl. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. So we have all these languages. Yes. At a Ruby conference, Ruby is the, probably the most popular, favorite language. But we do have others even in this room. Um, so we have all these different languages and they need to be able to talk to each other f through some mechanism because you're going to have some program that's written in fourth and it's going to have to do something and then some program that's written in Java or Ruby or Smalltalk or something is going to have to talk to it and how are they going to exchange the information? You know the basic is just a file and stuff like that. But um, when I started looking at this problem and trying to figure out what was going on, there were some commonalities between all of these different things. You have Languages that need to talk to each other. And what are the commonalities involved in ways of having things talk to each other? Um, actually, let's take it a different way. So what are some things that you learned in, com how many people have computer science degrees or a computer science background? OK. What are some of the things that you learned in computer science that have absolutely nothing to do with an actual language? Big O, Big o OK. Computational complexity. All right, who has the big assembler? <laughs> mix assembler. Mix assembler, actually. Well, that actually brings us to probably the big one I'm trying to get to. What is all of that mix assembler stuff used for? Teaching. Teaching what? Uh, data structures. Data structures. OK, that's the key one I'm thinking of, is that everyone here learned something about data structures. Yeah. Everybody. How many people have the big white book with the blue sweep on it that's got Rivist and somebody else? Yeah, OK. That's the one I learned on, too. So we have data structures. We've got all these great data structures. And every single language has some sort of implementation of a vast majority of these data structures. Some of them may not think of data structures by number. But hey, in Ruby, you've got integer, number, float, uh, rational, imaginary, all those different types of things. So you could consider it a data structure. Now there's other different things that are also a commonality between things that, between pan language things. Um, and the one I'm, another one I'm thinking of is communication. So currently, a little quick survey. Um, what does everyone currently use to communicate a data structure between different applications? SOAP. SOAP. Say again. CORBA. JSON and HTTP. Tab delimited files. Yeah, Marshall. Marshall. YAML. 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 Well, Marshall. Do you use that between languages? Uh, two different versions of Ruby, maybe. 
Okay. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. We could stretch the difference between languages, maybe a little bit. All right, so we've got Marshall, flat files of different formats. You have another one over here? No. Okay, there we go. So we've got all these, a couple of, yes, you had one? AMF. Say again? AMF. AMF. All right. So these are all different ways of communicating data structures between uh, programs. And I kind of think of them in two realms. We have network-based communication, and we have library, you know, API, IPC-based, flat file, you know, those are on. So basically, I think of these as network and local. So the network-based is communicating a data structure between different physical machines, and a local communication is something that's used maybe on the same system. It doesn't require some sort of network API. Does this make sense? All right. Now there's a third aspect to describing these tools to communicate data structures, and that is persistence. So I'm roughly, this may be something that may not everybody agree with, I'm kind of defining persistence in three ways. First, we have none. No persistence whatsoever. I think that's a valid way for persistence. There is none. <laughs> a, I'll get to one in a minute. Snapshot. Snapshot persistence, I kind of think of as things where you have something, it's got a data structure in it. Snapshot persistence is uh, just taking a snapshot of that data structure, saving it to disk or solid state or something like that. So these would be, um, I'll get into examples here in a little bit, but one of the things about snapshot persistence is the <coughs> amount that can be persisted to some sort of permanent storage is strictly limited to the amount of RAM that you have. So it's a snapshot of something in RAM that saves it to disk. Kind of think of it as a checkpoint or a rollback or something like that. And then the other one, I'm coming, these are all my kind of categories of persistence. So if you have better ones, please let me know. I'm great to incorporate them. Um, lifetime. And lifetime can mean the usefulness, lifetime of the usefulness of the data, or maybe it is forever. If the data is useful forever, then it may be forever. The data is only useful for a few days or while it's being worked on or something like that, then maybe persistence um, only counts, or lifetime persistence, persistence only counts as long as that happens. So, first we're gonna see if anybody's been paying attention. Hopefully you have. Um, we're gonna, using these three different descriptors, we're gonna describe a couple of different tools and see if anybody can guess what they are. So, these are two widely used cross-language tools. So first one, oh, that's just the equals. Network communication. So of these three things, we have communication, persistence, and data structure. So we're going to describe a tool in terms of these three different attributes. So the first one is this tool has network communication, no persistence. Any guesses yet? So HTTP, OK. No. RPC, and a hash data structure. No. Memcache. So that's what it is. It has no persistence. It has network communication and a hash data structure. So this is a cross-language tool. Uh, it's a server tool because it is network. And these are kind of how I'm describing it. Uh, if this taxonomy, if you will, doesn't catch, then let me know. I'll try to, maybe I'm thinking about this in the wrong way. This is the way I've been working on it. So it works for me. So let's try another one. This one is also a network communication. Oh, I'm one behind. Uh, has lifetime persistence. So this is data that is uh, saved for an, a long period of time for some reason. And it uses, say, a struct data structure. A database, yeah. Pick your favorite database. You know, have I set up everybody's yet? Yeah, there we are. So this is kind of, does anybody see where I'm coming from? This is just kind of the way I'm sort of categorizing tools in some sort of taxonomy. So again, we have our taxonomy. We have a data structure, huge selection of data structures. Communication, it's either network-based or it's local. And the persistence, it's either none, snapshot, or lifetime. And the other criteria for, for me, for a cross-language tool for communicating this type of stuff is it must support at least three languages. 
So quick little survey. Um, how many people are working on a project that has more than one language? OK. More than two. OK, so the ones that only have one language, what is it? JavaScript? Only, only JavaScript? Yeah, sorry, it's just only one language. OK. Uh, three languages. All right, what three languages? Uh, JavaScript, Perl, and Shell. OK, JavaScript, Perl, and Shell. Four languages. Yes? JavaScript, Ruby, Ruby, uh, Java. JavaScript, Groovy, Ruby, and Java. Five? Yes? <laughs> okay, so you got it. Sounds like an interest seven. All right. That's awesome. So I, I gave this talk once before, and um, there was nobody in the room that was working on a project that had fewer than three languages in it. So for me, I figure three languages is probably the rough average number of languages. I mean, even in your general Ruby on Rails project, you're going to have Ruby and JavaScript at least. Maybe some shell or something other along those lines. Say again? SQL counts too. Yeah, that's very true. So in, your, in every single Ruby on Rails project, generally you're going to have at least three languages, SQL, JavaScript, and Ruby. So, um, so this is kind of the background. And now I'm going to talk about a few different tools that I, that I enjoy working with and, um, and how they fall into this realm of stuff. So first off is Tokyo Products. Who's familiar with any of these? All right, smattering, which is good. because. There's, and the thing I started thinking about this is because in the past year, it seemed like there's been a, a proliferation of simple tools to do very you know, general things for many, many, many different languages. So in Tokyo, Cabinet and other products are one of the ones that's come to the forefront quite a bit. In fact, uh, I think there were two or three talks on Tokyo products at Ruby Kaigi and maybe two or three at, um, I just forgot the one that was in uh, Toronto. So for me, Tokyo Cabinet. I, I'm using this currently in production uh, in, terms of in terms of Tyrant, but we'll get to that in just a second. But this is kind of how I describe ty Tokyo Cabinet. Data structures, it has arrays, has hashes, it has structs. It basically has three different file formats, uh, hash or four, hash, vtree, table, and array. If anyone wants a fixed length file with fixed length number of records, it's really good for that too. Um, in terms of Cabinet, its communication is local. It's a straight library. That's it. Uh, persistence, lifetime, saves it to disk, another process can access it, that kind of thing. And then in terms of its languages, it ships with C, Perl, Ruby, Java, Lua, and Python. I mean, you can't ask for much more than, you know, a nice tool like that. Anyone using cabinet in production? We got one. All right. Two. Oh, in the back. Awesome. And Tokyo Tyrant is basically converts any Tokyo cabinet database into a network server. So you have the exact same data structures. You can have arrays, hashes, structs, uh, all that kind of good stuff. Um, it's network and lifetime persistence. So basically, a Tokyo tyrant just sits on top of a Tokyo cabinet file and gives it a network interface. Now, there's some pretty cool bonuses for using Tokyo tyrant. Um, one of them is compression. How many people, anybody using, well, there's only a few of us. Um, we personally are using Tokyo tyrant uh, to store XML files. And one of the interesting things about XML files is it's text and compresses really easily. So in Tokyo Tyrant, your values in your key value stores can be automatically compressed and decompressed with Zlib. So you get text, was that 80% savings, something like that. So that's really nice, useful. The other one is Tyrant uh, fully understands the memcached protocol. Have you ever wanted to have your memcached persisted to disk? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. OK, shut down memcached, start up Tokyo Tyrant, you're done. That's all you have to do. Um, the other one is Tyrant actually has a full RESTful API, API. You can speak HTTP to it with a GET request. It'll respond with the value at that URL. You can do a PUT request. It'll put a value at that URL. It's very, it's very cool. Yeah? Will it handle, handle expires? Uh, you, well, you can get to expires with a Lua extension. Which is right, and that's actually the, the sample they have on the website, is how to do expiring keys. So the Lua extension is very interesting, because in a Tyrant server, 
you can uh, have a Lua extension that, that can be fired off with a particular request is made. And I'm going to do some demos in a little bit, and I'll show you one exactly like that. The other thing is Tyrant has replication. You can do master, 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 slave, uh, master, multiple, slave. And I tried to break it by doing a master, master, master cycle. It didn't break, but I don't think it's supported. So, you know, it, it's, it's pretty solid. It's a very solid system, and I fully recommend using this in production. Um, and a slight pitch, I wrote a gem called Tyrant Manager. If uh, you do have to have more than one Tyrant, then check it out. That's it. Okay, who's heard of Redis? All right, more than Tokyo. This is interesting. So, um, okay, how many were at Mountain West? Okay, uh, all of you saw Redis there, I assume. Um, Redis is, uh, is another, and it literally calls itself a data structure <coughs> server. Um, it stores different data structures uh, than Tokyo Tyrant. Um, it has a list, hashes, and sets, and it'll also do your standard key value pairs and also increment, decrement of numbers, that kind of thing. But the really cool part is this list and set. This is where it really shines. It is a, uh, it's network based, it has its own protocol, um, and its persistence model is snapshot. That means that every so often Redis in the background saves everything that it has in memory to disk. It does it asynchronously in the background, so it'll save it, but if your server does die, then you do ha it'll recover from that, but you will have missed that window of opportunity between the last save and the current time that it died. So it's, it's, a, it's a good solid piece of work. Um, and it has a slew of languages. These are all ones that are written for it. You know, Ruby, Python, PHP, Erlang, Tickle, Perl, Lua, and Java. So this is a, this is a pretty good piece of work right here. Um, Redis also has some bonuses. It has replication. It'll do master, master, or master slave replication. So you can stream data from one to other. Um, it actually has server to server data movement. You can tell, hey, server A, take this record and move it to server B. And you don't have to tell it, you know, hey, get the value and then put it in server B. You just tell server A to put that value on server B, which I think is very, very cool. The one that I'm, I'll be demoing is in server set operations. So, Redis has all these set values. Well, you can say, hey, I've got these values in set A, these values in set B. Hey, Redis, tell me what the intersection of A and B is and return it to me as a list. So it's a, it's a niche area, but it, this, is the only pro, this is the only thing I know of that will actually do that in a network realm. It also has in-server sorting. So if you have a list, you can say, hey, give me the values from this list, but return them to me sorted. So you don't have to do it on your side. Uh, and then what I said before is the asynchronous snapshots in memory. Um, this is one that I think there's only one person in this room that may have heard of besides me. Anyone heard of libjlog? Okay. Uh, libjlog I like. I think it's a great tool. Uh, I have, unfortunately, have yet to actually use it uh, in an actual application, but I think it's a great concept. It is nothing more than uh, a, a library for doing publish, subscribe on disk between processes. It's, it's really cool. Um, it is used in production today, um, but not, not by me, but by the guys at Omni IT. They have it. Um, it is communication local. It is strictly a library. Um, and you open it up, you say, here's my queue, here's my subscription. You, another process can open up and say, here's my subscription. You know, one can publish, the other one can subscribe. It cleans up the disk as it's going along. It's a pretty cool thing. Uh, it does have lifetime persistence. Everything is on disk. There's, you know, you, there's nothing in memory other than just the operation of the actual library. Um, it has C, Perl, and PHP right now, and I'm currently working on the Ruby one. Um, and the bonuses here is we get actual publish subscribe behavior. So if I publish, if I have someone subscribes, you know, five different people subscribe to a queue, I publish once, all five people will get a copy. So it's that type of operation. Okay, Beanstalk D. How many people have heard of Beanstalk D? All right, I know a few people here that are actually using it in production. This is another one of my all-time favorite libraries. Um, in fact, so much so, I manage this one for Fedora. If anyone uh, needs this in Fedora or CentOS, it's there. Just yum install, you're good to go. Um, Beanstalk D is 
its data structure that it uses is a queue, straight up queue. That's it. Um, it has network communication, and uh, there is no persistence. So in this realm, it's essentially what memcache is, but instead of a hash, it's a queue. So you have memcache for hashes and beanstalk for queues. Um, it doesn't have any persistence now, but the next minor version release will include persistence. So that's on the way. And if you want to experiment with it, it's currently in the source code. Just the option to turn it on is commented out. So it'll be a minus, I think, minus D option on the command line. And just the use of the minus D is commented out in the library. Um, now, the really cool bonus on this is it's not just a queue. It's a, it's a job queue. So when you have, uh, you have someone that's pushing jobs onto the queue and many workers that are pulling jobs off the queue. This isn't publish, subscribe. This is straight queue. You know, when one person grabs an item, they're the only one that gets it. But it is job queue behavior. So uh, if someone says they're going to do the job, then they also have to say that they've done it. So you reserve a job. When you're done with it, you tell Beanstalk, I'm done with it. You can delete the job. So it is a strict job queue behavior. If the person who reserved the job fails and they don't do anything, the job will get reinserted back into the queue. So this is a, this is a great tool, excellent tool. Um, another one that, all right, zero MQ. Has anyone heard of this one? Aha. Yes, a new one for everyone. This has great, 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 great potential. Um, everyone here is familiar with Git, or a large majority of you are. So Git has this concept of the plumbing and the porcelain. Um, zero MQ, I'm considering, is the plumbing of any type of message system you want to do. You know, publish, subscribe, central broker, any of these different types of ways of doing it. It has the ability, and all the plumbing is there, to facilitate you implementing it your own, yourself. Um, it's zeromq.org. Uh, they are saying they are the fastest messaging ever. Um, and it is a, it's a queue, but however you want to add additional attributes to queues, you're free to do that in whatever way you want. Um, the communication is network. Um, it'll do both broker and you know just um, multicast, if you like, different types of things along those lines. Um, I haven't played with this in as much. It does ship with all of these languages currently from the vendor. So you get C, C++. Hey, COBOL, you're taken care of right here. <laughs> you're all good. Um, it is the only one that I've found so far that really has a good um, mono implementation. And it comes with a common language runtime piece. Uh, Fortran. Anyone using Fortran? All right. Well, you can use 0MQ with Fortran if you like. A couple other interesting things. This also speaks AMPQ. So if you, you can have it be an interface between your queuing system and an AMPQ queuing system. So it'll just sit there in the middle, and you can send messages back and forth, and it'll take care of the exchange. So um, the persistence on it is just in the past couple of versions has become lifetime. Yeah, I wouldn't really call it life. It wouldn't really call it life. It's the lifetime of the usefulness of the message. So what happens is um, you can set a high watermark for the amount of data that can flow into 0MQ. And if it crosses that high watermark, it'll start spilling it to disk. So you never actually cross a memory barrier. Uh, and then when, uh, when your current in-process messages have been drained, it'll start reading them back off a of disk and into memory. So you're not going to blow out the memory on your system with this one. It'll spool it to disk. Beanstalk, it'll go till you have enough memory. And I have almost. I put three million jobs on Beanstalk before of not insignificant size, and you know it couldn't really work it through because the processes couldn't have enough memory to actually pull the jobs off the queue. So that was a little fun. Um, but yeah, so this is basically lifetime of the usefulness of the message is what uh, its data star is. Now there's a couple. This is the bonus. I've probably gone over some of these already. Um, you can implement your own messaging models however you like. Uh, it has white papers, examples, documentation out the wazoo. So feel free to check it out. Give it a good look. I'm still working on putting together a couple of really good examples. So this one I actually won't be demoing today. Um, and as they say, fastest messaging ever. There are a couple of little, they do have one demo program for Ruby that does do a performance thing. And it's you know, one or two byte messages. And it's some god awful number of millions of messages you know, per second. So that's. This is the quick ones that, I, that I'm currently talking about uh, and uh, the ones I really like. There's a lot more. So 
Uh, MongoDB, there's we'll talk on that tomorrow. I'm going to it. Uh, NMDB is a network database. Uh, there's a whole, all this stuff. Anyone familiar with the term NoSQL now? Yeah, there's actually a mailing list. There was a conference once and uh, earlier this year. There's a lot of these different ones, and I consider all of these cross-language. How many people know about EHCache? Yeah, Big Java. They actually just, I think they just got purchased by Voldemort or Spring or somebody like that, I forget. But EHCache has a rep, hmm? It's used with Hibernate? Yeah, but you can use it in anything. It has a RESTful API. And it's been around a long time and it's very, 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 very stable. Um, Flare is a new one on the market. It kind of uses Tokyo Cabinet under the covers, but it actually it does its own. Um, it's used for if you want to have uh, sharded data. And Flare will actually spin up new shards on its own. So it's not, I wouldn't see it's really super stable yet. That's one I'm looking at. Cassandra, who's heard of Cassandra? Got a few. Uh, this is the one that was by uh, Facebook, right? Yeah, Facebook. Uh, it's getting some press lately. CouchDB, everybody likes CouchDB. Yeah, yeah. Uh, NetCDF, who's heard of that? Or HDFS5? Okay, so really old school technology. It's been around a very long time, but when you need to deal with massive, massive, massive quantities of data, um, it's probably got more experience than any of these in doing so. And it's basically, it's a data file format for storing um, self-describing data. So I'm probably gonna look at it for a few different things here and there. Um, solar, who's used solar before? All right, it's a cross language storage tool. I mean, you can think of it as a column store. It's more than just a full text search index, but solar, I use solar a lot. Um, did I miss any? Anybody got some favorites that I haven't mentioned? Awesome. Well, if you do find some more, let me know, because I'm starting to collect all these. It's fun. Um, there, it's, it's fun to see all the stuff that's coming around in the past year on terms of stuff. So now let's get on to some demos. I'm gonna have to switch to uh, mirrored. All right. So we'll start out with, let's do Tokyo Cabinet. Um, so the da sample data I'm using is first and last names from the uh, U.S. Census. So it gives us a nice little variety of data. And I have a little tiny library to read some of it, uh, just so you can see what it is. And it, I just have these things called data files. Uh, pulls them in. The files have name, the frequency percent, cumulative percent, and rank of a name. It's either first male first name, female first name, or a last name uh, from the U.S. Census. So. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, definitely need to increase the font size. Tell me when. Okay. All right. Come back here. So the, is there a question? No. Okay. Where my tabs went? Oh yeah, that is kind of interesting. Um, so this is Tokyo Cabinet. Little quick demo. Um, I think probably the most underutilized file format in Tokyo Cabinet is the table file, which is essentially a key value store, and the value is a hash. And basically, columnar database. Some of the cool stuff you can do with this is you can index a column. You can tell Tokyo Cabinet, I want you to create an index on, in this case, the name field. And then you can ask for a query of anything that has a name that matches blah, and it'll be a super fast lookup, because it's actually indexed. So in this case, we're just gonna index all the last names. So I'm using Rufus Tokyo, which I think is probably one of the better Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Ruby lives these days. Gonna load up the last names. Uh, we're gonna, this is a time metric, I'm just gonna show how fast it does. Uh, and then for each name, we're gonna store it in the table. And the record is a hash. Uh, it's those four different fields. And we're gonna store them, pick a random one, and print it back out. So it is something like 86,000 names, so it might take a couple of seconds. Five, four, three. It's all running locally in 
Yeah, it's all running locally. This is Tokyo Cabinet, which is pure local. It's just a straight library. And so this one, we've got 88,799 records, storing them at 12,000 records a second. Not bad. Uh, and we picked the random, oh, random last name is uh, Edelertz. Anyone have that last name? OK. Uh, and it was, and this is just one record out of the data. So this is a quick example of how to use Tokyo Cabinet. Pretty much, you can use it as a hash. And the value store is, um, depending on your database, is either a value or it could be a hash if you're doing uh, the table format. So feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time. Uh, next, we're going to do Tokyo Tyrant. So I need to start them up. Nope. So this is the Tyrant Manager gem I mentioned. So I've got two different Tyrants running. They're going to be for two different demos. Um, in this case, this is a sec exactly the same demo. Oh, am I editing it elsewhere? So in this case, it's pretty much the exact same code as the first time. We're just going to use men's first names this time instead of that. So it's essentially the exact same code as the local Tokyo cabinet, but this time we're using a network server. So this could be on any server we wanted. In this case, we're talking to localhost port 1978. Uh, Tyrant uses port 1978 by default. It's, I think, the birth year of the author. Uh, so this case, we're just going to store all the male names and then pick a random one. So it's exactly the same code as the last time. We've pretty much just uh, re replaced Tyrant Table here instead of Tokyo Cabinet. That's pretty much the only code changes. And in this case, there's only 1,200 records. Uh, stored them at 4,000 a second. So it's one third as slow, but it is network over the network. And it's got to save it to disk. And uh, the random name is Warner. Anyone by the name of Warner here? OK. Oh, well. So. Uh, uh, depends on if people are reading it at the same time. If you're just talking raw insertion, um, I'm not sure what it would be. But it's at least comparable. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've heard a good, good number of stories of people using MySQL as just a key value store. You know, it works out pretty well. And it probably also depends on whether you're using DB or my ISAM backend. And if, you're doing bulk inserts. and if you're doing bulk inserts or individual inserts, yeah. This is, more, this is actually mostly testing the speed of Ruby. Um, yeah, in this I, case. When we, when we use Tokyo Tyrant, yeah. uh, like, it'll, it's maxing out and inserting as fast as it mm -hmm. can, but if Ruby crosses 100%, and Tokyo Tyrant's getting more like Exactly. That's a good point. And I should also mention the library I'm using here is also uh, Rufus Tokyo. Uh, Rufus Tokyo, and this is using the FFI side of Rufus Tokyo. It also has uh, the Edo side, which is uh, which is wrapping the actual um, Ruby code that ships with Tokyo Tyrant. So this is slower than optimal usage, but most cases it's pretty good. Four thousand inserts a second, I, I can deal with that. So the next one here is a Lua demo. So I said before, if you have Tokyo Tyrant, then you can actually do um, Lua inside it. And the way we do that is call an, an ext function. And I'm actually running out of time here shortly. So we're going to breeze through this real quick. I'm going to call the add function uh, and give it a record and insert it. So in this case, we're going to use female first names. And then the Lua function is i2 Lua. And all it really is is when we're given the function a key and a value, then I'm going to get the length of the of the uh, of the name, and then I'm going to create a new key, which is the count dash length of the name. And I'm just going to keep a running total of essentially the histogram of name lengths as a separate key in it, and it's going to be managed by Lua. And there we go. So uh, it looks like the most commonly freak, the most common size of female first names in the United States is six characters long. So oh, you know that's I mean I think that's pretty cool stuff where you can have you can give it a record and tell hey Lua do this and you can call any function if you write the function in Lua put it in the file then you can invoke it remotely and it can do pretty much whatever you like. Let's see let's do a Redis one real quick. 
That one shouldn't take more than a minute. So I'm just starting up a Redis server here. And, okay. And. And in this case, we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to demo the, uh, the set capabilities of Redis, the in-server set stuff. So in this case, we're going to use all sets of names, male first names, female first names, uh, and common last names. And we're going to store them. Each one, the key is going to be first name, last name, or, or male name, female name, last name. And the values are going to be the list of names. So you know the last names is going to have 88,000 members in it. First names is, male first names is like 1,000. First female names is 4,000. Uh, and then we're just going to look at all the, intersection possi the intersections possible and have them printed out. <laughs> okay, so we inserted 94,000 records at 9,000 records a second. Uh, and then we said, hey, look, there's 331 names common between male, male and female names in the U.S. as of the last sentence. Uh, you know, between female names and last names, there's 1,300 <laughs> names that, you know, well, a woman who worked for my dad, she was Kelly Kelly. So, you know, that's, it happens. Maybe they're not, they're not always in the same person, but it happens. <laughs> and there's 1,000 common names between male first names and common last names. So, I mean, this is, this is set operations in server. Uh, I've, I, have, I have a use for this. This may not be uh, useful for everyone, but I think this is a pretty cool operation. Um, and I think we have time for one more, or questions. Which would you guys prefer? Demo. Demo, okay. All right. This one's going to be Beanstalk. So in this one, it's, this is a trivial one, I will admit. Uh, let's see. Oh, and this is the log of Redis. Now we're going to do Beanstalk. Okay, that's Beanstalk. Um, so we have a producer, just a standard producer consumer. We're going to store jobs and remove jobs. So Beanstalk, there's a great Ruby library, Beanstalk, Beanstalk client. Uh, just install it. We're going to say, I want to talk to a Beanstalk server on this server, and I'm going to create a queue on it, or in Beanstalk terms, that's called a pipe. Beanstalk can have as many pipes as you like. Just put them all in there. They exist, uh, they exist so long as there's data in them and someone's talking to them. If there's no person talking on that pipe, then it just disappears, so long as there's no data in it. So we're going to iterate over all the last names and insert them into the queue. Pretty simple. And then we've got a consumer, and it's just going to read them off. And so here's what I said. We're going to grab a job, we're going to get the body of the job, and then we're going to delete the job. So if we didn't put this delete in, the jobs would actually never leave because it's a job queue. It's not a standard queue. It's a job queue. And we're just going to print out as it's doing it. So I'm getting another terminal. All right, so let's, let's store them. And over here, we'll do consumer. So we're consuming, boom, 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 boom. Over here, we're producing, oh, there we are. Consuming. I mean, Beanstalk is trivial, trivially simple. It's, it's just a great, simple, simple tool. Oh, it's done inserting all of them. And this guy over here is just an infinite loop. And it'll when it stops, it's consumed them all. So that works. That's all my demos. And I think I've got one minute left. Questions? Comments? Was it useful? All right. All right. Thanks.